All right, so I've entitled our time tonight, Warnings as we approach Christmas. There's some things that we're going to see in Scripture tonight that really we need to be on guard against as Christians heading into this Advent season. But let me say this, <laughs> before I even get into this lesson, uh, before you label me as the Grinch, there are a lot of things that I enjoy about the Christmas season. Uh, number one, I love uh, during the Christmas season, getting to see a fire burning in the fireplace or in the wood stove. To me, I love that. I've always loved that as a kid, especially as an adult. Uh, some people see that as a burden to have to have a fire. I love it. I love the smell. I love uh, our fireplace has a glass in front of it so you can see the fire burning. I love it. I love certain things about Christmas. I love being able to spend time uh, with the kids. It's, it's different. Christmas is different when you're spending it around kids. They just bring this, this, this certain joy about seeing the kid excited about the simple things. Uh, I like uh, Christmas songs. Don't tell Emily that because she, she likes Christmas songs a lot more than I do. Uh, but there's cer certain Christmas songs that I enjoy listening to during the Christmas season. I especially like this season because the world is singing our songs as Christians. So I sat in an assembly this past week and heard Meade County High School singing our songs, many of which were unbelievers, but they're singing about the king that bought us. I love Christmas because the world is singing our songs. Um, I like to look at lights. For me, there's just something about light. Uh, I like looking at old lamps, like the old oil lamps. I like looking at Christmas lights. So this is the latest out there before we go on. Brother Travis is not the Grinch. There are certain things he likes about uh, the season of Advent and Christmas. There's a lot of things, and I can say this, that I do not like about the Christmas season. I do not like the traffic. I do not like the crowds. I do not want to go to E-Town or Louisville this time of year because there's so much traffic, I do not like it. I do not like the shallowness of the Christmas season. So much of our culture waters down the meaning of Christmas. We focus on lesser things. So with all that being said, when we think about Christmas, there's favorable things and less favorable things. I want you to understand, as we talk about this Christmas season, understand that you will, if the Lord gives you this Christmas season to live, you will make memories this Christmas that will last the rest of your life. Your children and your grandchildren are only going to be this age for a short time. So... Enjoy this Christmas season. With all that being said, uh, tonight we're going to look at a few different passages talking about just some certain dangers that we want to avoid during this season. And I hope that after looking at these passages and that after looking at these warnings, we'll stay clear of those things and enjoy this season. It's a good thing to enjoy Christmas. Something that I've neglected for years. All right, first passage, 1 Timothy chapter 6. I hope you're there. No need to stand at this point, but I want to, I want to explain a little bit of what's going on. Uh, so Paul is telling Timothy, he's addressing a lot of different groups of people. For example, verse number 1, uh, it says, Let all who are under a yoke of, as bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. So the first group he's talking about here is slaves, and then he gets over, uh, really in verse number two, to talk about believing slaves. And he tells them, those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better since they, excuse me, serve all the better since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. And then... Uh, Really, he keeps going, and he's going to start talking about, I guess we could label them as heretics. Uh, Paul tells Timothy about heretics, those who are in ministry for money, and he warns Timothy about that. 
And then you, you really keep reading. I want to skip on down to verse number 9. It says this, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. So he's talking about, he's talked to, he talks to all kinds of people. Eventually he's going to get to us. I want you to see there's all kinds of people being addressed. The verse we just read, verse number 9, he's addressing people that want to be rich. He tells them about the danger of that. Stay clear. And then on, on the tail end of that, verse number 10, he talks about the dangers of loving money, possessions. He says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. That's helpful to remember, right, during this Christmas season. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. He warns them. And then... And you don't see this much in Scripture. You get down to verse number 17. Paul is telling Timothy, and he's addressing rich people. Like there's, We don't see that much in Scripture. Look at verse 17. He says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. Now here's, he goes on to say, But set your hope on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. In verse 18, they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. And then the last few verses, verse 20, Paul's addressing Timothy specifically. Now, why do I give you all that background? in order that we can look at verse number 17. That's what I want to narrow in on as we begin. It says, but on God. He's saying, set your hope on God, who richly provides us with everything. Some translations use the the word, He gives us every season to enjoy. God has given us collectively, as a church, every season to enjoy. Every season. Every spiritual season, every physical season. Thanks be to God, we live where we do. We get to experience the changing of the seasons. He's given us this season in order that we can enjoy it. And it's again a a reminder in verse 17 that all seasons come from the Lord, All good things also come from the Lord. So whether it's looking at the glow of a fire, whether it's listening to people sing, whether it's giving gifts, whether it's receiving gifts, whether it's getting together with family, all of those good things that we enjoy in this life are from who? They're from the Lord. And He tells us to enjoy those things. It says, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Now here's my encouragement before we even get to our first point this morning. It's so easy for us as Christians to preach against Christmas. And what I want to encourage you to do is not to preach against Christmas. It's okay to enjoy Christmas, but there's some things that we need to do. There's some dangers we need to avoid if you want to enjoy Christmas this year. Number one, the first thing that we need to avoid is this, doctrinal danger. We need to, we need to avoid, and we need to be cautious, and we need to avoid doctrinal danger. This is on the screen. Mr. Clint's going to hit the next slide. Didn't give you guys a paper tonight, but if you've got something to scribble down, this would be helpful to write down. What I mean by this is many times during the the Christmas season, we substitute the temporal for the eternal. Take your Bibles, if you will, and let's read together Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. I'm just going to read the first three verses there. Feel free to keep turning. I'm going to go ahead and read. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, 
seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So again, during this Christmas season, do not exchange the things that we're supposed to be seeking, the things that are eternal, the things that are above, for temporary things. It is Christ coming that we celebrate this Christmas. That's, that's what we're to be focused on as Christians. Now here's where we trip up as even mature believers. Instead of focusing on Christ coming, many times we focus on the temporary things that surround Christ coming. I mentioned this in this morning's message. I can remember uh, thinking of myself as a sharpshooter Christian. What I mean by that is people would be excited about Christmas and, oh, I can't wait till Christmas gets here, December 25th. We're celebrating Christ's birth. And then in my arrogance as a growing Christian and, and as my head began to expand, my heart didn't. And I, I would I'd like to point out to people the theological mistake of, hey, you know, we don't know that Christ was born on December 25th. It could have been February 2nd or March 3rd. And by doing that, I was focusing on the temporal rather than the eternal. We've got to celebrate Christmas someday. Why not the 25th? Why get caught up sharpshooting things that really, in the grand scheme of things, don't even matter? It's a pagan date. <laughs> it's not our job as Christians to change the date of Christmas. Not what the Lord's called us to do. Don't focus on temporal things. It's not a hill to die on. No, we get so out of whack as we begin to grow in Christ sometimes. Not only with trying to point out the date of Christmas, but then we get into things such as Christmas trees and Santa Claus. You know, I talk about this just very briefly because there are probably some people that wonder or are trying to navigate leading their families. Uh, what about what about Santa Claus? Like, is this is this dangerous for us to tell our child about Santa Claus? Um, is this something we should avoid? And I, I think on this point. We can draw application depending on where our family is, you know, after we pray through it. Our family doesn't push Santa Claus. Now, probably for a lot of selfish reasons, I didn't want to have to explain to my kid five or six years after they're born, hey, I've lied to you for five to six years. So selfishly, I didn't want to have to, to backtrack and call myself a liar. I, I just didn't want to do that. Now, I will tell you this. There's a problem in doing that because then your kids go around telling other kids, hey, you know what I'm saying without me saying it. And then people look at your family. <laughs> I won't even get into that. What we should focus on, rather, Sam scratching his head. He didn't know this about Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to... We're just going to keep moving. There's a lot I'd like to say. but we're not. Our focus should not be on Santa is coming. Our focus should be on the Savior is coming and He has came. So however that works its way out in your family, that's what we need to focus on. Let me say this before we move on. We should not, as Christians and as Christian families, gospel-centered families look down on other people who do talk about Santa Claus. Wow. Like, we probably need to hear that. We don't look down on people who do choose to do those things. But my encouragement to you is this. Look past Santa. Look past the marketing. All this stuff that's going on during the Christmas season. Know what you believe and know why you do those things because you're not responsible for anyone else. You're responsible for your family and your focus should be on what your family believes. You can't change what other families do. So if you're diehard, no Santa Claus, you don't try to change anyone else. You express what you believe. 
but then let the chips fall where they are. Don't look down on other people. Let me say this before we move on. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 18 says, And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Now listen to this. This is the key. That in everything, He might be preeminent. Why do I bring that up? Preeminent means surpassing all others. In all things, Christ should be preeminent. He should be first. Especially during the Christmas season. Christ should be above all else. That should be our focus in Christmas. And everything. So whether you are getting together, whether you're singing Christmas carols, whether you're sitting by the fire, Christ should be preeminent, preeminent in those things. He should be where our minds go first during those things. All right, so we've talked about this. We need to guard against doctrinal danger. We need to watch out substituting the temporal for the eternal. Now, let's move on to number two. What's the second danger that we need to watch out for, especially in this Christmas season? Last time I read this verse, which was a few hours ago, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 20, the Bible says, For we are ambassadors for Christ. That's what the Bible says. Christmas time is one of the best times to be an ambassador for Christ, to represent Christ. Do you know what an ambassador is? An ambassador is someone that goes to another place and represents. So the ambassadors for the United States that are in Uganda, they represent the United States of America. What they say represents us. An ambassador for Christ, everything they say, everything they do, the decisions they make, represent Christ. You see, Christmas is a great time to be a representative of Christ. His songs are being sung everywhere that you go. Some good, some bad. But for the majority, most of them are, are pretty good. Have you noticed during the Christmas season, many folks, their hearts have somehow, their hearts are more softened during this season than any other time of the year. Even unbelievers, their hearts are receptive. I have found, I encourage you to, to test me on this. I have found that during Christmas, you will find many divine appointments in some of the most unexpected places with some of the most unexpected people. They have a, they, it's much easier to share the meaning of Christmas during this time. It's, it's easier to be an ambassador for Christ. So I want to encourage you with the second point. Watch out for the danger of impressing people and focus on imparting. So don't get caught up in impressing. Focus on imparting. Imparting is giving the truth of God's Word. It's easy. It's so easy to get focused on the obligatory, mundane things of Christmas. Hey, i got to decorate this. i got to do that. Don't worry about impressing people this Christmas. Wearing yourself out cooking and decorating all these things. I love watching the. If you have one of these, uh, I, I pull no punches tonight. Have you seen people who put all these blow up things out in their yard and they put all these decorate? I love watching people do that. I'm not focused on doing that. I'm not going to do that. I like watching them and, because it. The first little bit of Christmas, I mean, you look at their yard, it's pretty, they've got all this. And then one good windstorm, it's wrapped around the trampoline. And I'm just telling you guys, much of what we do, this obligation, is just, it's time killing. And so I just, again, don't feel obligated to impress. What you should feel obligated towards is understanding that you have a great message to impart. That's what we should focus on this Christmas. Don't be a Grinch. Don't be against those things. Be winsome. Share the truth of God's Word. 
If you fail to share the gospel this Christmas, you are missing a great opportunity. People's hearts are softened. I mean, it's just, it's volleyed up for you. It's, this is the season for this, to talk about Christ coming. Here's two questions before I move on. How can you make the Savior known this season? How can you impart instead of impressing? How can you personally do that? How can you as a family make the Savior known? It could be basic ways. Participating in Advent with your children or when your grandchildren come over. Maybe reading the Christmas story when family gathers. Just, just read through Luke chapter 2. and Just simple ways. All right, so we've talked about doctrinal danger. We need to watch out for that. We need to watch out for impressing rather than imparting. And number three, I think this is really important as well. Notice, now we see a personal danger of spending more than we have. That's a big danger during the Christmas season. Now, I'm not going to pretend to act like I have this all together because this is a, this is a big danger. Let me just spell this out for us. Be careful pulling the plastic out of your wallet and inserting the chip in order that you make people happy or you maintain this sort of standard of giving. Watch out for that. Be careful about adding to your debt this season. That's a, that's a big danger. I'm, I want to say this because it come up as I was studying. Don't feel bad if you don't buy Christmas cards to put in these little slots here in the back. Now, why do I say that? There are people who will spend a lot of money trying to get a picture took and then trying to get it put uploaded to such and such website and then get them mailed out to who knows how many people during the Christmas season. And they rack up, just don't, I'll say this, I'll be the one to lead me. It's entirely possible that this Christmas you may not get a fancy Christmas card from your pastor that has the Thomas and Cree on it. Why? Well, in, in, in past years you have. But this Christmas I just don't, just don't have it. It would, it would be an unwise financial decision to, to, to buy all the, their expenses. So I'm saying this. Don't put yourself in a financial pinch when you don't have them. I hope you're alleviating. What do most people do with a Christmas card? Let's, let's be real here for just a second. Some of you guys did it after church. I know you did. You opened the Christmas card. Oh, that is pretty. And then you threw it in the trash can. Many of you did it. I bet, we, I bet we could look in this trash can back here. Some of you guys may not even made it out of the church without throwing away Christmas cards. Some, some of the cards are nicer than the others, and we look at them for, what, an hour or so. Uh, the family pictures, those are, those are pretty, but they just don't last. And think about the hassle it took for them families to get everybody to get. You said words that you'll never be able to take back trying to get your kids to smile and to pose the way you want. Don't, don't worry about it. Don't stress yourself out. If you do it, no condemnation. I'm not going to look at you in a, in a certain way, but don't put yourself in a financial burden to print those silly cards. Don't do it. Let me give you some helpful tips. I know you already labeled me as a Grinch. You want to send me back to the cave. Let me just give you some financial uh, tips going forward for this Christmas season. Just kind of steering you away from debt. The first one, understand making a gift is always better than buying one. You say, ah, oh, you're cheap, Brother Travis. You're cheap. Some of, the mo some of you guys in this room are super creative. You are. Uh, use the creativity that God gave you in order to make someone else a gift. Some of the most meaningful gifts I've ever been given have been handmade. There is a Bible holder that was given to me by a gentleman here at this church that gets used all the time. It's a handmade gift. But it means I wouldn't take 
a lot of money for it because it was, it was made by somebody. It, it means so much more. Another financial tip moving forward, planning ahead is always better than impulse buying. When you wait to the last minute to buy Christmas presents, you're always going to end up spending more than what you have. You're in a pinch. You don't know what to do. You just, just swap the card. Just spend more than what you have. Don't do it. Guard against last minute buying. Another one. It's always better to limit your list rather than expand it. Sometimes we feel so obligated. Well, I got to buy this person something. Or I got to. Don't feel obligated to buy. Last, and then I'm going to move on. Please don't think it has to have a price tag in order for it to be meaningful. It doesn't have to be expensive in order for someone uh, to be blessed by a gift. Now, what I'm about to share with you, these are older figures uh, from years ago, but I still think they'll have a good effect on what we're talking about. Americans spend $8.5 billion, with a B, during the Christmas season. Now, those numbers have increased, I'm sure of that. But listen to this. $150 million are spent in America every year, if not more, on Christmas wrapping, just on the paper, which usually is just taken directly to a black trash bag. 150 mil. Think about your Christmas when kids open the gift. You just, you just take it right off the gift, put it in a trash bag. 150 million dollars spent for what? To go to the landfill or to throw in the wood stove. That's what we do. But the point is this: we just we spread ourselves thin. Listen, to this 100 million dollars are spent on Christmas trees. Now I'm not, I'm not saying that you don't wrap presents. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying I'm against a Christmas tree. We have a Christmas tree. It's beautiful. Emily put it up. It's quick. It's one of these quick deals. It's already got the lights on it. You just layer it up and it's done. Best Christmas tree I've ever, ever had. I used to absolutely despise. You have to wrap them lights around. I'd have to hand them to Emily. And if you want an unlit Christmas tree, I got one for you. Worst. Pre-lit, boom, it's done. All right, listen to this. $200 million are spent on postage each year. Postage. The point is this. If you don't have it, don't spend it. Why do I say that? The day after Christmas, you'll thank me. Because you've got you to pay it off. Somebody's got to pay for it. I just think that's a helpful warning for us to be reminded. Some of these things you may already know, but I'm hoping this will subtly remind us so that we don't head towards these dangers. Number four tonight, we talked about the personal danger a little bit. Now let's notice the physical danger of Christmas. The physical. Now some of you guys know where I'm headed with this. And again, I, I pull no punches tonight. I've always found it strange, even as a little boy, watching pastors get up from behind the pulpit and rag out and talk down to people who drink too much when they themselves eat too much. I've never understood that. How can someone who is fat stand behind a pulpit and judge someone who struggles in a different area than they do. I've never understood that, especially with Baptist preachers. How can you condemn when you yourself are out of control in your eating? So just, just practically, as we're going forward here tonight, the danger here at Christmas, I just encourage you, serve less. Put less portions on your plate. You say, this sounds silly. But it, it is a legitimate danger. I know and I have experienced the cooking here at Raymond. I know you guys. You're great at cooking. But I want to submit to you tonight, would it not be wise instead of making these great meals and then camping out over them, leftover after leftover after Thanksgiving, would it be wise if we took some of that surplus that we have and give it to somebody else who may not be able to make a Thanksgiving meal? Would that not be wise? 
hack up some, give it to another family. I know of houses in Irvington right now. When was the last time you drove through downtown Irvington? I'm not just talking about next to the barbershop and post office on the 60. I'm talking about you drove through those roads. Have you done that lately? There are people in our backyard that would welcome a good meal. Plenty. I heard about a dad that was talking about this topic with his kids about, you know, possibly taking a meal to other families. Well, here come Thanksgiving, and they had this nice big turkey laid out, and it was, it was cooked. It was about time to eat. And then one of the kids said, Dad, you remember what you taught us about, about giving our food away? How about we take this turkey and go give it to this family down the road, and us just eat vegetables? Well, the dad had taught on it, so they went and took it. He said that was the healthiest <laughs> holiday meal that they'd ever had. It probably wouldn't, it probably wouldn't hurt any of us to, with, to take a meal to somebody else. Now, I know this is probably not what you showed up to listen to tonight, but I, I do want you to know there is, I mean, it is concerning how overweight people have become. I mean, it's true. So, as we look at this, we really need to watch it, especially if you stand on the pulpit, if you're leading a family, if you're leading a Sunday school class. It's hard to have a stirring testimony and a vibrant ministry. It discredits much of our testimony when we're overweight. How can we say, I'm controlled by Christ? whenever we can't even control our forms. So again, that's a big danger. We need to watch out heading in to Christmas season. It's a physical danger. Now I want us to notice number five. We're on number five, Mr. Clint, I think. Yeah, the psychological danger. Uh, And this is, we've got to watch out building ourselves up only to be let down. Now, it's easy for this to happen at Christmas. We, we get our hopes up on many things only to find out things are not what we expected. Take, take your Bible and turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. I mean, these are some helpful verses, whenever, especially during the Christmas season. So Hebrews chapter 13, I'm going to start reading verse 1. It says, let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Right, so again, Christmas season, don't neglect to show hospitality. Then you get to verse number three. Remember those who are in prison. Stop there. We've had times within the life of Raymond in which we had different members who were in prison. In the Christmas season, you know, we, we were to remember those people that were there. That's all I'm going to say about that. It goes on to say, as though in pri- as though in prison with them and those who are mistreated since you also are in the body. I'll look at verse 4. It says, let marriage be held in honor among you and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Notice verse 5 helpful for Christmas. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Look at verse 7. Remember your leaders. How can that be applied to Christmas? I want to encourage you. Leaders and authority in your life it would be helpful for you to remember them during the Christmas season. Now, why do I say that? We have different politicians, whether you agree with them or not, they're in authority over us. It would be helpful to remember them during the Christmas season. Maybe write them a note. There are leaders within your family. It might be helpful for you to remember them and verbally express thankfulness to them. There's, me- there's leaders within this church. You have Sunday school teachers. You have pastors. It would be helpful for you to remember them during the Christmas season. Now, why do I say that? Let me show you why. All right, so we received all kinds of Christmas cards last year. I'm not going to say who sent this, but I received, our family received a Christmas card last year. This is what the front cover looked like. Pretty simple. It was, a, it was handwritten, and inside the note said this, 
and I, I kept it. It says, thanks for bringing me closer to Christ. Now, all the Christmas cards I received last year, this is my favorite. Why? Because somebody took the time to write a note, very simply encouraging one of their pastors. You know where this is? I have a little closet in our house that I do. I, I call it my war room. It's where I pray. It's where I read my Bible. It's where I do my sermon manuscripts, all of that. This, you can see a little hole right here. And so I got a desk, and then there's a wall against the closet. Not a lot of room. This note is sitting right above my laptop. And so all this past year in discouragement, uh, you get tired, you get weary. Hey, is anybody even here? What's being said? I look up at that note and says, Thanks for bringing me closer to Christ. And it just puts wind in your sail. I want to encourage you to encourage your leaders. This is one, one personalized out of everybody who took the time to do that. Pastor Appreciation. When was that, last month? You got one note. One note of encouragement. And I'm, not, I'm just saying... Just puts wind in yourself from one family. And I've got it. And guess where it's at? Right above my laptop. I have two notes there in front of my laptop. And it's notes of encouragement. So when we read here in verse number 7, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. So again, Super encouraging. I want to read one more verse. Verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Christmas builds up. It over-promises and under-delivers. But when we read verse number 8, notice Christ never over-promises and never under-delivers. If you set your heart and your affections on Christ this Christmas, you will not be let down. If you set your heart on Christmas and presents and expectations, you will be let down. One story, and then I'm done. We're going to do an invitation. Years ago, uh, I, this is going to be hard to uh, picture in your mind, but years ago, as like an 8-year-old boy, played basketball. I know, you can go ahead and, to, and laugh. So on a team called the Clyde Cardinals. Clyde was my hometown, and we were Cardinals. Sounds pretty fierce, doesn't it? Just a Cardinal. I don't, anyways, moving on. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, we were, I was all decked out. I had, uh, it's going to be hard to believe, but I had Jordans that I wore. And do you guys remember those uh, pants that had the little snaps on them? And so when you're ready to play basketball, you just, you just pull those things and the little pop. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? I don't even know if they still make those anymore. But I mean, I had it all. Played basketball. So, as I expressed interest in basketball, my dad found, who knows where, probably at my grandpa's house, an old basketball goal that used to be my mom's. It was rough, but he got it, and I think he put some plywood on the back of this rim. He painted it up, and he poured a little bit of concrete, put the basketball, and again, my dad's not athletic at all. He poured some concrete, put the basketball go up, and uh, hung it up. He gets it up. The thing's way too high. <laughs> He'd already concreted it in the ground. I go to him as a little boy. I'm like, Dad, this basketball goal is way too high. He said, if you can get it in that basketball goal, you can get it in any basketball goal. Never changed it to this day. It's still there. Um, but I remember as a, as a boy, I wanted a good basketball. I always got those, like the, the cheapest of the cheap that got those knots on it. You dribble it and go uh, I always I've seen people that had those indoor outdoor basketballs. You know, they're they're a lot slicker and I just enjoyed those kind. And so I went to my grandma who lived just right across the road and I dropped hints basically every day, a few times a day, that I wanted a new basketball. A good one. I I'd circle it in the Kmart paper. I don't know if we don't even got Kmart anymore, but I'd I'd circle what I wanted, very specific. I'd go and uh, well 
we would always get together on, I, I, I'm building this up because my expectation was so high. I wanted a basketball. Christmas Eve come, which is when we got together with my grandparents, and we would eat a meal and then open presents. So I'd, I just hurried through my meal, and I was snooping around the presents. They were all under the tree, and I noticed a large box. Went over, had my name on it. I started picking it up. Everybody's still eating, and I'm shaking it. And you can hear it. I, I, mean, I knew it was a box, and it hit the side, and then go this way. And I just I knew it was a done deal. Had a new basketball. So I waited patiently after that. Probably not really, but waited. Time to open the box. Open it up. It was a it wasn't a basketball. <laughs> it was a globe. <laughs> Let me say that again. A world globe. <laughs> I was so disappointed. I mean, we I'd always look at globes at their house, and uh, I always thought it was cool. But I had my heart. I had my desire like that was I wanted a nice basketball and yet I got a globe and so I went to her and I was asking I'm like hey no did you not see the Kmart paper <laughs> like here it is and uh, I remember saying well you'll use this one day uh, you'll use this globe one day and I think the Lord was setting me up even back then to have a more global perspective. Instead of looking at temporary things, to look. And I can take you to this day. I know exactly where that globe is. It's never made the trip to North Carolina, but I can go in my grandparents' house, and I guarantee you I can take you right to where that globe is. I say all that to say, friend, Christmas can let you down as a child, but Christmas can also let you down as an adult. Understand this. Christ will never let you down, ever. I've shared with you five dangers that we need to watch out for. So I want to pray for us, and then we'll continue on with the reason why some of you guys may have come. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you for uh, the season that you've given to us. I want to thank you uh, for the Christmas season and all the joys that we're able to experience. Lord, thank you for giving us this time as a church family. Thank you for giving us time as individual families to get together, to just sort of retract from the normal ebb and flow and just, just spend time together. Lord, thank you for this season in which we can listen to great music. Uh, thank you for allowing us to eat great food. Lord, for many of us, thank you for allowing us to to have this time to reflect on family, and maybe even family that's going on to be with you. So I pray, uh, thanking you for this Christmas season, but also for the provision that you've given to us this last year, everything that you've provided for us. But I want to ask before we go to an invitation that would you would continue to Watch over the families that are here, the individuals that are here. I ask that you continue to bless them during this season. Lord, please guard us from these dangers, these warnings that we have laid out here tonight. Allow us to enjoy this season, understanding that you have you've met our greatest need in Christ. Help us not to look down on other people. Help us to understand what we believe. Be ready to speak it when it's appropriate time. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.